Thank you, Presiding Officer. This morning, the Transport Minister was asked to give clarity about what the government knew about the partial closure of the Queensferry crossing and when they knew it. Uh, he failed to do so. So can the First Minister clear this one up for the thousands of people who rely on it? First Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to do so, as indeed the Transport Minister did on the radio this morning. But before I come on to the issue of uh, ministerial and public knowledge, which I will do in a moment. Let me just address the central issue. I think most people listening to this would understand and accept that it is entirely normal for snagging work to be required on a large infrastructure project. And of course, the Queensferry Crossing is one of the largest infrastructure projects ever carried out in Scotland. Uh, this particular piece of work will be done over five days starting tonight. The bridge will not be closed during those five days. Instead, southbound traffic will use the existing fourth road bridge, which actually demonstrates the increased resilience Absolutely. that comes from having Absolutely. two bridges in place. Uh, yes, there will be further snagging works required over the coming months. Again, entirely normal on an infrastructure project. But let me make this very clear, presiding officer. The work that will start tonight is the only identified snagging work that will require peak time lane closures. Any future lane closures that can't be avoided uh, will be at night, not during the day, and not during uh, peak hours. Uh, and of course, under the contract, all snagging works are carried out at no additional cost to the Scottish Government. Uh, let me now come to the issue of ministerial and public knowledge of this matter. Uh, when the solution to this particular uh, piece of work had been agreed, uh, ministers were told that happened last week on Tuesday uh, of last week. Uh, and as soon as there was then confirmation from the Met Office about the weather window that is required to carry out uh, this work, that happened on Monday of this week, Parliament and the wider public were informed. In other words, there was no delay. Things happened completely timorously. But my last point, presiding officer, is this. Some of the opposition MPs, that I, MSPs that I heard commenting yesterday appeared to be giving the impression that this concept of snagging works being required had never before been shared with anybody. Uh, but on the 28th of June this year, David Climey, who is the project uh, director, appeared before the relevant parliamentary committee and he said this about what would happen after the bridge opened to traffic. And I'm quoting here from the official report. Uh, he said, there will be a phased handover of between three and six months. It will happen gradually as the remaining snagging and other work is completed. Now, some of the MSPs who were commenting yesterday as if they had no idea about this were actually present uh, during that committee session. So finally, presiding officer, uh, all snagging works that are carried out will be done in a way to minimise inconvenience to the travelling public. That is the priority of Transport Scotland. It's the priority of those responsible for the bridge and it's the priority of this government. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, officer, I thank the First Minister for that long and instructively defensive answer. Um, but lost in there... <laughs> lost in there was the fact that Transport Scotland knew that the road over the bridge was faulty when the bridge was opened back in August, because that's what they said in Parliament yesterday. Yet the Transport Minister said this morning that he knew nothing about the partial closure until last week. So is the First Minister happy that nobody in government apparently knew anything about a major fault in what she's just called one of the largest infrastructure projects in Scottish history? First Minister. This really is quite desperate stuff, but it is of importance to the travelling public, which is why I am giving long and detailed answers to correct some of the misinformation that Ruth Davidson and others seem to want to convey. Uh, in terms of the point about August, at, at that point, uh, Transport Scotland and those responsible for the bridge uh, did not know what work they required to do to fix this particular uh, stretch of road uh, that they realised uh, had not been laid 
with incorrect tolerances. So they had to do further investigative work. They had to look in detail at what would be required uh, to fix uh, that particular defect. And when they had done that, uh, they informed ministers as they would have been expected uh, to do. They informed ministers last week, as the Transport Minister uh, has already made clear and as I am making clear today. The uh, further uh, bit of information that they had to get clarity on was when they would get a weather window to allow them to carry out that work. So they got that information from the Met Office on Monday of this week, uh, which enabled them to say that the work could start on Thursday tonight at 10 o'clock when it will start and they then advised Parliament and advised the wider public. That is entirely the correct way for this issue to have been taken forward. And finally, uh, let me just remind Ruth Davidson of this. Uh, the bridge will not be closed. Those coming southbound over the bridge will use the existing fourth road bridge. So we will continue uh, in partnership with Transport Scotland to make sure that any Snack. You see, the, the Conservatives want to put misinformation around, but they don't actually want to listen to the answers. Not one of them. Not one of them is listening to the detailed answers that are being given right now, which I think speaks volumes. So we will continue to make sure that any snagging works entirely normal on a major infrastructure project are carried out uh, with minimal inconvenience to the travelling public. That's our priority, it's my priority, and it's the way we will continue to work. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. See, President Officer, what jars here is the way that they pushed through the opening of this bridge in the summer and claimed it as a symbol of SNP competence. But now there's a problem. It's don't look at us, we're just the Scottish Government. In September, it was jobs done and pats in the back all round. But on Monday, we were told there'd be another five days of work needed. And then yesterday, those five days became another 10 months of possible disruption. So doesn't the First Minister see that it's the, the dripping out of this kind of information, rather than simply levelling with people, that is damaging the public's trust? First Minister. Firstly, Ruth Davidson says that somehow the Scottish Government are trying to pass the buck. I'm standing up here giving detailed answers that she and her colleagues, again, are not interested in hearing. Uh, secondly, Ruth Davidson accuses us of pushing through the official opening of this bridge. This comes from the same party who, I think if memory serves me correctly, were complaining bitterly when we announced a 10-week delay to the opening of the bridge. The bridge opened at a time when it was right for the bridge to open because the travelling public could start to use the bridge. And in any construction, you know, I, let, let's take this back to the personal sphere. Anybody who's ever moved into a new house knows that snagging is required on construction projects. There is snagging work to be done. The project director told Parliament in June there would be a period uh, of three to six months of snagging work. That is being carried out. Now, the last point... Order. I think people watching this, presiding officer, I think will take a lot from the fact Order. the people across this chamber are not interested in listening to the facts but I will I will carry on with the facts the last point I want to make in response to Ruth Davidson is this point about 10 she said five days has turned into 10 months that is completely and utterly inaccurate as I said in my opening answer if Ruth Davidson had been listening of course there will be further snagging works that will be required. But this is, this is the only piece of work that will require daytime uh, and peak time lane closures. Other work, if it requires lane closures, will be lane closures during the night time period. So this is important. It's important to the travelling public, but it's also important, I think, presiding officer, for everybody to keep a sense of perspective around it. Ruth Davidson. I think the First Minister has to learn that if she wants to take the plaudits, she has to accept the failures too. Yes. Presiding officer, the First Minister is right in saying that motorists have been pretty patient up until now. But over the coming months, they deserve some straight talking. So lastly, can the First Minister be clear 
on what happens now? Because she's just said, and in her first answer, there'd be no further peak time closures. So can she actually tell motorists what other closures and partial closures over the coming 10 months they're going to be facing? How many, how long, what sort of level are we talking about? And finally, will she actually ensure that her ministers get on top of works that are needed to keep our country moving? First Minister. Well, if Ruth Davidson had listened to any of my previous answers, she would have got the information that she's just asked me for. If further lane closures are required, as further snagging work is identified, then they will take place not during the day, not during peak hours, but during the nighttime period. And the operators of the bridge will inform the public in advance if those lane closures are required. That is the normal way of doing things in a construction project of this nature. The other point, of course, to make about the repair that will start tonight is that it is essential to allow uh, the bridge to move to a 70 mile per hour speed limit and of course that will happen before the end of December. This is a massive construction project. It was made clear at the outset that there would be snagging required. It was made clear at the outset that the speed limits would be introduced and increased on a phased basis. That is what is happening. That will continue to be taken forward properly uh, and any further work that requires to be done at no cost to the Scottish uh, Government will be done in a way that minimises any inconvenience to the travelling public. That's the right way to proceed. And if in future Ruth Davidson wants to actually listen to the detailed information she's given, then she might not have to ask the same questions over and over and over again. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, pr <laughs> That's quite enough, Presiding officer, last week I met with representatives from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. They told me that just to stand still, local government needs an additional £545 million in the Scottish budget in two weeks' time. Will they get it? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm glad that Richard Leonard met with COSLA last week. Uh, the Finance Secretary met with them uh, this week to discuss uh, budget uh, issues. Obviously, we will set out our budget uh, on the 14th of December and we'll set out our spending uh, plans at that time. But as can be seen from uh, previous budgets, we have in a very, very difficult and challenging financial climate with our budget being cut by uh, Westminster yes, governments at Westminster. Yes, in fact, next year, our budget being cut by more than £200 million in real terms, in terms of the revenue budget for day-to-day -day spending. Uh, but within that challenging financial climate, we have uh, treated local government uh, fairly, uh, and we will continue to do so in this financial year, taking account of core funding, health and social care, integration funding and of course council tax reforms, uh, there was an extra just under £400 million uh, available in spending power for local authorities. Uh, so with the cuts imposed by Westminster, with our need for example to ensure significant increases in the health budget so that it can deal with rising demand, I'm not pretending that it's going to be easy for local government or for our budget generally, but we will continue to do what we always have done, and that is treat local government fairly. Richard Leonard. Um, Presiding officer, it's a straightforward question which demands a straightforward answer. Scotland, Scotland, Scotland's councils, Scotland's councils need, need more than half a billion pounds to simply maintain current services. That is teaching our children in schools, providing care services to our elderly, and keeping public libraries open. The First Minister talks about councils using council tax powers. She knows full well that increasing the council tax alone last year would not have closed the austerity gap which she imposed on Scottish local services. And she knows. And she knows. Order. And she knows. And she knows full well. She knows full well that we cannot trust the Tories, that the money will need to come from her government through progressive taxation. Earlier this week, it was revealed that local councils 
are being forced to draw upon emergency reserves just to keep day-to-day -day spending going on essential frontline services. So can I ask the First Minister again, will she deliver the funding that local government needs to provide the services that the people of Scotland need? Yes or no? First Minister. The Scottish Government will bring forward our budget on the 14th of December. And in that budget, and this is the way that governments the world over uh, decide and present their spending plans, we will put forward the settlement for local government as we put forward our spending decisions uh, for other parts of the public sector. Uh, but you know, I thought Richard Leonard's uh, question there was very illuminating because he was, I think, probably trying to get his defences in uh, early, but not particularly effectively. You see, Richard Leonard's core argument here is that local government doesn't have enough money. And I would be the first to agree that this is a very challenging period for local government. That's why we made reforms, or it's partly the reason we made reforms to council tax yeah. to allow yeah. councils to raise additional revenue. Uh, and all councils uh, in this financial year opted to take advantage of that with the exception of eight councils across the country. Each and every one of those councils that chose not to increase council tax revenues were Labour-led councils. So right now, there could be millions of pounds more going towards local services had Labour councils taken advantage of every opportunity they had to raise more revenue. And until Richard Leonard can answer the question why they didn't, there's always going to be a pretty big flaw in him coming and presenting these questions to me. Richard Leonard. Well, the answer is simple. Even if every single council, the length and breadth of Scotland, had, even if, even if, even if they had raised Order, by a full three pence the council tax, that would have raised 70 million pounds. Your government cuts were 170 million pounds last year. So the reality, the reality is this, the SNP government has taken Tory austerity and doubled it for local councils across Scotland. So how can, how can the First Minister possibly promise to cl close the educational attainment gap between the richest and the poorest children in Scotland if she slashes the budget for education and schools? How does she possibly expect our elderly to live in dignity in retirement when she cuts into the budgets for social care. And how on earth, how on earth can we stop people sleeping rough in shop doorways in freezing temperatures when housing budgets are being cut to the bone? Presiding officer, in the end, austerity is a political choice and not an economic one. So what does the First Minister choose? Tory cuts? sharpened and so deepened by her government or re-empowered local communities, properly resourced local services, will she stand up for the communities and for the people of Scotland? First Minister. Well, let me just try and work my way through what I have to say was a bit of an incoherent rant and try to answer <laughs> here, here. questions that I could identify. Firstly, uh, within a context where this government's budget is being cut by the Tories, we have uh, put £120 million direct to head teachers in our schools to tackle the attainment gap, we are, which Labour voted against, incidentally. We are investing record sums of money uh, in delivering 50,000 affordable homes across our country. We have a rate of house building in Scotland that outstrips that seen anywhere else in the UK and in terms of homelessness just this week we were announcing additional funds uh, directed by an expert group yep. to tackle the problem of rough sleeping not in the future but this very winter but I come back to the central point here Richard Leonard's argument appears to be uh, that because uh, he thinks councils should have got more money then it was right for Labour councils to turn their back on the money they could yeah. have had. That is a ridiculous, incoherent argument Absolutely. that says that Labour prefers politicking yeah. over delivering for the people across our country. Eight, 
Eight Labour councils at the start of this financial year turned their backs on more than £20 million of funding that right now could be getting spent on education, social care and other council services. Uh, so Labour really doesn't have a leg to stand on on this issue because its own councils didn't take the opportunity to maximise the resources that it had to spend. This government will continue to make sure that maximum possible resources go to local government and local services as we work hard to protect people against the Tory austerity that's imposed on this parliament. A constituency question from John, John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, uh, Monroe's construction in Easter Ross processed recyclables for Highland Council. At two minutes past uh, 10 on Friday, the 17th of November, Highland Council sent a letter by email advising the company that the contract due to expire the following day would not be completed. Uh, it would not be extended. The contract was awarded to a French multinational company, Suez, who have said that, that Tupi doesn't apply to the employees. And I'm now told that due to that indeterminate employment status that the 31 workers are not being able to claim benefits. Henceforth, recyclable um, waste from the Highlands will go to Newcastle. First Minister, will you please have your officials urgently look at this case, the various aspects of this case, and see what assistance the Scottish Government can get, provide to these workers and their families? First Minister. Well, I thank John Finney for raising the issue. I'm not uh, aware of the details of, of the issue he has raised. Of course, I will ask my officials to look into it and uh, see if there is any assistance that the Scottish Government can offer. Uh, from what John Finney said in the Chamber, it sounds as if this is very much a matter for Highland Council, uh, but obviously the issue he raises is of concern to the workers that, that he uh, talks about. So yes, I will have officials look at this and I will uh, reply to John Finney in writing when I've had an opportunity uh, to look at the detail and uh, decide whether there's any action that it's appropriate for the Scottish Government to take. And uh, another from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is 73% owned by the UK taxpayer, has announced it will close two branches in my constituency in Kilburnie and Salcoats. This follows on from a wave of closures in recent months by the Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale Bank and TSB. The scale of bank closures is now so great it is making life very difficult for many older and vulnerable people. Banking is, of course, reserved. Are you aware of the UK government taking any action to ensure that high street banking does not disappear completely from Scotland's small and medium-sized towns? First Minister. Well, I, I certainly share uh, Kenny Gibson's concerns. I think uh, many people are concerned at the scale of uh, bank branch closures across Scotland, and uh, those concerns will be shared by communities and small businesses that rely on access to local banking services. So I recognise that this is a worrying time for branch staff uh, directly affected by closures, uh, but uh, also appreciate, of course, that banks have commercial decisions uh, to make. People are carrying out their banking in a way today that is different from uh, times in the past. Uh, however, I think what we all appreciate and what I certainly am acutely aware of is that banking services must consider the needs of everybody across society. Uh, there is a continued need for face-to-face -face provision uh, in banking. So the Scottish Government will continue uh, to engage closely uh, with banks uh, as they implement uh, changes. We uh, regularly engage with senior representatives from uh, all major companies in the financial services industry. Of course, the regulation of banking is ultimately a matter for uh, the UK government. I'm not aware of any particular action the UK government is taking uh, in this, on this issue, uh, but it would be for them uh, to act in terms of uh, more uh, regulation, but we will continue to engage in terms of the economic and social impact. Question number three, Willie Rennie. People who depend on the bridge over the fourth have been commendably patient but this is now the third Christmas of disruption. People are fed up with ministers' boasts, self-congratulation and excuses. Who spends over a billion pounds on a new bridge, then closes it weeks later? Who blames commuters for queues on the bridge? Who knew it could get windy in Scotland? The First Minister told us the new crossing was the culmination of a momentous journey but now we discover that journey involves a bypass over the old bridge. <laughs> With work predicted to last until September next year, the completion of this crossing will be two years late. People deserve openness at last from this government. So can I ask again, can the First Minister explain what is this work that will last until September? Can she list the work in detail that needs done? 
First Minister, but can I ask members please to keep the volumes down? First Minister. Well, there are so many inaccuracies in Willie Rennie's question that it's actually hard to know uh, where to start. I mean, he talked about uh, the third Christmas of disruption. This is work that will start tonight and be completed by next Wednesday uh, morning. I think next Wednesday morning is uh, the first week uh, of December. And as I said earlier on, that is the only identified uh, snagging work uh, that will require lane closures during daytime or peak time hours. So uh, Willie Rennie's characterisation uh, there is completely and utterly uh, inaccurate. Uh, secondly, Willie Rennie, I think the official record uh, will, will bear this out, I, I think, said there that the bridge uh, will be closed. Uh, that, again, is simply not true. The bridge will not be closed. Uh, southbound traffic for a period of five days uh, will go over the existing fourth uh, road bridge. And I think it's really important in raising, in raising what are important issues that members of this parliament do not mischaracterise the situation uh, that is happening. Uh, and secondly, he talked about wind. The wind protection on this bridge is significantly better than the wind protection on the fourth road bridge, uh, which is why this bridge will be more resilient in future to wind than has been experienced before. So, you know, let me again just try and bring a sense of perspective. I don't want to see any inconvenience to any person who requires to travel across the Queensferry crossing, but I think most reasonable-minded people know that on a project of this scale and complexity, uh, once the bridge is in operation, there will be snagging work that require to be carried out. Their expectation of the transport authorities and of their government is to ensure that those works happen in a way that minimises that inconvenience, and that is exactly what this government will continue to do. Willie Wren. People will appreciate the First Minister's pedantry over whether this bridge is closed or not. This, Order, please. This, this is the third small business Saturday that has been hit for three years in a row. Three years in a row, small businesses are paying the price of this government's incompetence. I think it's reasonable to ask these questions. The government's priority has not to be in disrupt the ceremony with troublesome facts. And the problem is now piled on the backs of commuters and businesses. The question has got to be pressed. The transport minister didn't even know about this closure until last week. But yesterday, a committee of this parliament was told a decision was made back in August to close the bridge. He normally brags about filling a pothole, but is absent from decisions about the most important mile and a half in this country. This is a question about the quality of governance and the quality of the decision making that tries to string it out for three months, then closes the bridge on the busiest day for business. Why hasn't the First Minister been able to explain why the Transport Minister was absent? First Minister. Well, Firstly, what Willie Rennie uh, wants to call pedantry, I call accuracy yeah. and honesty. <laughs> Secondly, as the Transport Minister has set out, as I've set out again today, it was not known in August what would be required to be done in order to fix this particular stretch of road. Uh, there had to be investigations uh, and a design for this repair had uh, to be prepared. When that had happened uh, and when uh, it was known that that would require a lane closure and the diversion of southbound traffic to the existing fourth road bridge, ministers were informed of that. We were informed of that last week. And when it was known when the weather would allow the repair to be carried out, Parliament and the public were informed of that. That is exactly how these things uh, should happen. Um, and more generally here, what we have is uh, a bridge, as I've said repeatedly today, one of the biggest construction projects in the history of this country with some snagging work requiring to be done. Now, I know that politics comes into play when we debate these things in this parliament. I'm not complaining about that. We all are guilty of that. But I think most people who use the bridge 
And most people who travel across this bridge will understand that once a bridge like this is in operation, uh, there will require to be pieces of work done uh, to deal with any snagging defects that arise. That is what is happening here. I regret that it is happening because I don't want to see any inconvenience to the travelling public, but it's important to put these things right, uh, not least so that the 70 mile per hour uh, speed limit can be introduced uh, and so that people can continue to use this bridge in the way intended. So let's focus on that and with the greatest of respect to Willie Rennie, let's stop mischaracterising what is happening. We have a couple of further supplementaries. The first from Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I declare an interest as a member of the British Veterinary Association. Scotland is a nation of animal lovers, and there's a huge public concern that in the Brexit bonfire, we've lost Article 13, the principle of animal sentience. Does the First Minister believe that Article 13 represents both the recognition of sentience and the requirement that all policies from government respect the welfare of all animals? And if so, will the government ensure this principle is written into Scots law before we're dragged out of the EU? First Minister. Well, I uh, absolutely uh, agree with the thrust of Matt Ruskell's question. I, I certainly recognise uh, the, the, the concept of animal sentience, as uh, I'm sure he is aware uh, that is already written into Scots law, although I do share his concerns that this... Uh, is one of the many implications uh, of Brexit that may involve unintended consequences. We will continue to make appropriate representations to the UK government and we will continue to take whatever action is required here uh, in this parliament to continue to uh, ensure the protections that come from EU law uh, which are put in jeopardy uh, by the wrong-headed Brexit process. And Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I am a PLO to the First Minister to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to mark World AIDS Day tomorrow with a particular focus on reducing the stigma of HIV? First Minister. Well, I think it's incumbent on all of us to play our part in reducing the stigma associated with HIV. Tomorrow, of course, is World AIDS Day. One of the simplest things we can do, which many of us are doing, is wear the red ribbon uh, that signifies World AIDS Day. Um, one of uh, the things, of course, uh, that uh, a lot of awareness has been built around is the fact that HIV is no longer uh, the death sentence that it once was. People uh, who are diagnosed with HIV and get on to effective treatment go on to live long, happy and healthy lives. That's why it's important to raise the awareness of testing. I took a test uh, yesterday to demonstrate how quick and easy it is to do and I would encourage uh, all members in their own constituencies to look uh, at doing likewise. Uh, there is still stigma associated with HIV, it's unwarranted stigma uh, and all of us have a responsibility to help reduce it and ultimately eliminate it. Question number four, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on its plans to deliver access to superfast broadband to 100% of premises by 2021. First Minister. Uh, yes, I will, with a, a great deal of pleasure. Uh, we are uh, committed to delivering 100% access to superfast broadband for all Scottish homes and businesses by 2021. That is a commitment that is unmatched anywhere else in the UK. It stands in contrast to the UK government's lack of ambition, uh, which will see those in most rural areas elsewhere in the UK consigned to the slow lane in terms of internet speed. Uh, it has become abundantly clear uh, that we cannot wait for the UK government to deliver for Scotland, which is why the Scottish government has chosen to act and procurement for the reaching 100% programme will commence shortly. Sorry, uh, Fulton McGregor. I thank the First Minister for that response. Can she advise what difference the Scottish approach to rolling out fibre broadband has made to my constituencies in Coatbridge and Crichton? And can she further advise how the UK government is supporting this 100% ambition, given that it's a reserved matter? First Minister. Well, as a result of the £428 million invested through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, 97% of homes and businesses in North Lanarkshire, which includes Fulton McGregor's constituency, now have access to not only fibre broadband, but broadband at superfast uh, speeds. Uh, we have invested uh, through the Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Councils, more money in that digital superfast programme than the UK Government. That is allowing us 
to meet our commitment of 95% fibre access by the end of this year. Uh, of course, we now move on to the Reaching 100% programme. And just to be clear, what that is, is a commitment to deliver super fast broadband with speeds of 30 uh, megabits per second to 100% of residential uh, and commercial premises across Scotland by the end of this parliament, backed by significant public funding delivered by the Scottish Government. There is no similar commitment anywhere else in the UK. Now, we will set out further uh, details of that in the budget, but that will involve hundreds of millions of pounds of investment uh, by the Scottish Government. Uh, so far, the UK Government has said that it will commit £20 million pounds to that. If I was Scottish Tories, I wouldn't be boasting no, about that. Exactly. I would be deeply embarrassed about that. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, on something that technically is a reserved responsibility of the UK government, it's because they have failed to act that the Scottish government has got on with doing the job for them. Peter Chapman. Thank Peter you, Chapman. presiding officer. But I'm afraid the first minister has completely missed the point the UK government was making. The facts are... <laughs> Order, please. Listen to the, the question, facts please. Are, the Scottish Government was given funding for phase two of broadband in 2014. Three years on, it has not even started its procurement. Yeah. And that, that puts Scotland behind every single English local authority, behind the Northern Ireland Executive and behind Wales. My constituents will therefore welcome UK funding for the next generation of broadband going directly to local authorities. Surely the First Minister must welcome that as well. First Minister. Actually, that completely, we're getting to the nub of the issue here because that completely misunderstands the approach that the Scottish Government has taken to procurement. You see, in England, in England, the, the Tories might want to hear this. Okay, let's hear in the England, answer, please. Because their initial procurements were small scale local authority procurements, they required additional phases. In Scotland, we put in place the Digital Scotland Superfast programme. That was on a bigger scale than anything that happened anywhere in England. That now enables us not to go to a phase two of the initial programme, but to go straight from that yeah. to the reaching 100% yeah. programme. And actually, yeah. with the agreement of the UK government, oh. their measly 20 million pounds is being put towards that. But you know what? That's a commitment that will cost hundreds of millions of pounds to deliver. So as I said earlier on, if I was Scottish Tories, I wouldn't be boasting about a measly £20 million. Pounds. I would be embarrassed by that. So if the UK government wants to take responsibility, well actually they already have it, if they want to discharge their responsibility to delivering 100% broadband, super fast broadband coverage in Scotland, then be our guest. Step forward and do it. But be warned, it will cost you an awful lot more than £20 million. But if the UK government doesn't want to discharge its responsibility, it should stop misleading people and let the Scottish government get on with doing its job for it. Mr Grant. Really Grant. Can I ask the First Minister if she agrees with me that it is totally unacceptable that Orkney has connectivity rates of 65%, a lot lower than the 95% she was talking about? Or does she agree with her Cabinet Secretary's arrogant assertion that Orkney would have zero coverage without the Scottish Government's intervention? Is it not time that both our governments stopped this destructive war of words got together with local authorities and delivered 100% coverage for all. First Minister. Well, actually, actually the, the member raises a, a reasonable point. The, the fact of the matter is that in Scotland, we are uh, delivering broadband it, because of our islands uh, and remote communities in one of the most challenging geographies anywhere in Europe. And I think that's got to be recognised and remembered. So uh, the, the member 
points to the figures in Orkney, uh, which, yes, 65 uh, per cent uh, have access to fibre broadband. Of course, remember, the reaching 100 is about getting superfast broadband to 100 per cent of premises across Scotland. But the key point is this. Without the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, uh, backed by investment from this government, that figure in Orkney, if it had just been left to the commercial market, wouldn't be 65 per cent. In Orkney, it would be 0%. So it is the intervention of the Scottish Government and councils and Highlands and Islands enterprise that has taken a figure that would have been zero in Orkney if left to the market to the 65% that it is today. And of course, it was Ofcom, it was the independent Ofcom that published a report saying that Scotland had made faster progress in delivering broadband over the past year than any other part of the UK. So we will get on with doing the job, meeting the commitment we've got for the end of this year, and then getting on with delivering 100% superfast broadband to every premise across Scotland, which again is a commitment that is completely unmatched yeah. by any other government anywhere else in the UK. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what maintenance procedures are in place for the new Queen's Ferry Crossing. First Minister. Uh, maintenance of the Queen's Ferry Crossing will be the responsibility of the Trunk Road Operating Company, Amy. Uh, the contractor for the bridge, the Forth Crossing Bridge Constructors, retains responsibility for construction defects or snagging that may arise following the completion of the project. Uh, the works that begin tonight are snagging works and are therefore the responsibility of the contractor. Liz Smith. Uh, thank the First Minister for that. Uh, we know, First Minister, uh, that there are also uh, defects in the wind shear protection on the Queen's Ferry crossing. Could the First Minister confirm to Parliament whether these are faults of workmanship or design, and whether the press comment earlier this week, which reported that there was a safety issue because some parts had fallen into the River Forth, are accurate? First Minister. Uh, there are no safety concerns over uh, the Queen's Ferry Crossing wind barriers and I know everybody in this chamber would want to be uh, very clear in communicating that message to the public. Site inspections uh, found that three panels uh, were incorrectly fitted. Uh, these have been repaired by the contractor. Uh, adjustment of the windshield panels is ongoing as part of the contractor's finishing works and will be completed uh, by the end of the year. Uh, routine inspections are carried out on all bridge elements and there are no safety concerns about the wind barrier or indeed any other uh, elements of the bridge. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with Amazon regarding the living wage. First Minister. Uh, Amazon has brought many jobs to Scotland, but we must ensure that these jobs are of good quality and provide pay rates in keeping uh, with our ambition, which is to see the real living wage replace the national minimum wage. The Scottish Government has held several meetings with senior Amazon officials to discuss the Fair Work agenda, including the benefits of pay paying the real living wage, and that dialogue uh, will continue. Of course, in Scotland, we now have proportionately uh, more than five times as many accredited living wage employers as in the rest of the UK, uh, which I think is testament to our commitment to making Scotland a living wage nation. Jackie Bailey. In March 2016, the then Minister for Fair Work, Rosanna Cunningham, urged Amazon to sign up to the real living wage, but they didn't. In December 2016, the current minister, Keith Brown, met with Amazon and called on them to adopt the living wage. Amazon said they would consider it. One year on, they're still not paying the real living wage, and we have also seen reports of unacceptable working conditions. Companies like Amazon receive substantial sums of public money. Will the First Minister consider linking payments of regional selective assistance in future to payment of the living wage? First Minister. Continue. We will continue to give consideration uh, to that. Uh, we have uh, said uh, all, all along that we will continue to encourage companies to pay the living wage, to sign up to uh, the business pledge, but of course we'll keep under review uh, whether uh, there should be the linking of support uh, to policies uh, like that. Um, I've heard uh, Labour politicians, I think including uh, Jackie Bailey, uh, talk before about the, the money that Amazon has had in uh, grants for uh, employment. And that indeed is true. I think it's important though to point out that no financial assistance has been uh, given to Amazon since 2015. 
Uh, all of the uh, amount that Amazon has received was between the years of 2005 and 2015. And when I checked these figures, actually, I found that almost half of that total amount uh, was awarded to Amazon in the years 2005 to 2007, uh, of course, when Labour were in charge of these things. So we will, we will continue to support employment creation. We will continue to encourage inward investors into Scotland because that's good for our economy uh, and good for jobs. But we will also continue uh, to press the case for fair working practices, including the living wage. Jackie Bailey. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister might need to be reminded that the living wage was actually introduced in 2007 when her government were in office. Thank you. I'm not sure that's a question, but it's a point. Uh, that... Sorry, that's right, but it was more of a statement than a question. Okay, I'll allow the First Minister, I'll allow the First Minister a chance to respond if she may. Okay, thank you. The First Minister may respond if she wishes to, to that point. Well, indeed, which is why, as I said in my original answer, we proportionately have more than five times as many accredited living wage employers than any other part of the UK. In fact, we've got a higher percentage of people in employment paid the real living wage than any other UK nation. So there's work still to do, uh, but I think the Scottish Government, indeed, uh, those who pursue these policies on our behalf deserve a lot of credit for the progress made. Thank you. And I think that concludes First Minister's questions. I think I saw a point of order from... Mr. Rumbles. Thank you. Presiding officer, I, I do believe the First Minister has inadvertently misled Parliament over when the problem causing the partial closure of the Queen's Free Crossing was first known. Yesterday, in evidence given to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, Ms. Rennie, a civil servant as head of major transport infrastructure projects, said that she knew about this problem back in August, before the bridge was opened. There is a legitimate question as to why the Transport Minister was unaware of this if the head of his major transport infrastructure projects was. Presiding Officer, the First Minister said it was important to have all the facts about this on the public record. I agree with her entirely. Can you, Presiding Officer, please ensure that the official report of yesterday's committee's proceedings are published immediately so that the First Minister and everyone else can read it for themselves. Thank you. I thank Mr Rumbles. That's not a point of order. And the official report will be published in due course. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Jackie Bailey. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.